Many of you will be aware, but for those that are new to LEA, uh, we were founded in 2003 by Dan Jones, co-author of The Machine That Changed the World, Lean Thinking and Lean Solutions and the Lean Strategy as a not-for-profit organization. Our aim is to help people become self-reliant on their lean journey. We have products and services that we offer to customers based around three key value streams, learn, teach and coach and share. At the intersection of each of those processes is our lean learning journey platform where we're writing down in a usable form the key knowledge required to learn and implement lean. The materials are organised around the lean transformation framework, which we both research and develop with, with, uh, with partner organisations. The materials and processes that we develop are based on a fundamental principle. Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. We've done lots of research to understand how to learn lean most effectively. Uh, we know from practical application that skill or capability development is best described as a journey. A guided learning path progressing from awareness and knowledge of a subject through understanding, being capable and finally to be being able to teach and coach others. We have always offered on-site support to help people on this progression, but 18 months ago, we started to, to develop a plan to offer this online. The coronavirus pandemic hit us really before we were ready, but um, we had started. We developed a new website, an online platform in which to develop modules and a process for conducting support remotely. I'm sure that as we come out of lockdown, we'll go back to what we originally planned, a combination of coaching remotely at short intervals to cement learning combined with on-site delivery at the, at the workplace. To put today into context, um, the materials are all about knowledge, so skill level one. However, you can develop your understanding uh, by learning yourself online using the practical problem solving level two course to become capable however you need to practice just like learning a language or riding a bicycle or using playing a musical instrument and that's best done on real problems at the workplace we offer teaching and coaching for this and we offer a process to help you once capable to be able to train and teach others in your organization this approach mirrors what we know from the best from the way that the uh, the excellent lean companies like Toyota develop capability. It's simple and effective. It uses a plan do check out methodology at each stage and is pretty much far removed from things like lean competency systems, belts and certifications that we, off that we often see uh, offered by consultancies really with the aim of selling workshop and training days. As one Toyota veteran recently told me, belts have no place in a good lean organisation, they're for trousers. Um, with the introduction out of the way, let's move on to today's content. David is going to explain the Teach Poster concept before providing an introduction to problem solving uh, in terms of purpose, process and people. We'll then take questions. Peter will give an overview of the eight steps of practical problem solving and then hand back to Dave who will share insights around the problem solving journey using A3s. Peter will discuss how to develop an understanding on both your lean journey and the, and the journey to develop your colleagues before I lead the final discussion and question and answer session. So I'll now hand over to Dave and um, he can get us started. Thanks, Dave. So um, just before we get into the presentation, um, just like to spend some time about uh, why we use the Teach Poster concept. So for a sustainable lean transformation, we're strong believers, believers in the concept of leaders as teachers. So that is leaders who take the time to teach and coach their team on the job to develop their capabilities rather than relying on separate functions to do it for them. As we know, the benefits of doing this are huge in terms of advancing your lean journey better, faster and cheaper. But the challenge is how to provide materials that enable leaders to do that. So after a number of years of research and experimentation, um, we found that this teach poster concept kind of works best. So rather than a 100 page PowerPoint slide deck, we try to distill um, the subject matter down onto sort of one piece of paper, a bit like an A3, I suppose. We found that this is much less daunting for leaders to use and much more informal than sitting down in a classroom and looking at a screen. Um, all the posters that we're developing have a similar layout uh, and structure, 
so making them easier to follow and remember. And as you can see, we try to use images and pictures over words to stimulate interest and discussion. We write a facilitation guide for each of the posters, uh, covering the important steps, uh, the key points and the reasons for each of the images to assist the leader when they start out uh, on their teaching journey. And finally, the poster obviously can be put up in your workspace uh, for future reference rather than being you know, hidden on a, a PC or on a PowerPoint presentation. OK, so we're going to go through the upper portion of the uh, eight step practical problem solving poster, and we always start with the Lean Transformation Framework or LTF and cover purpose, process and people. So purpose positions the subject and why is it important? Process the conditions and considerations required to apply it. And people, the roles and responsibilities required to make it happen. <clears throat> OK, so we all start with the LTF, uh, which is in essence our approach or how we do lean. And uh, we ask where does the topic kind of fit in? Well, as you can see, the framework consists of five dimensions, uh, which all need to be considered for a successful lean transformation. These dimensions can be asked as a series of questions and starts with number one at the top. What is our value driven purpose? And more specifically, what problem are we trying to solve? So clearly you need to be a competent problem solver if you're going to answer the first question. However, it's probably likely that you're going to come up against problems when tackling questions two through to five. We therefore see problem solving as the, um, and the thinking way as the number one lean skill. And that's the reason why we decided to use it to launch our lean learning journey platform last year. I suppose if you kind of think about it, a lot of the familiar lean tools that we know and love like 5S or standard work or value stream mapping or SMED, um, you know, we're all created to try and solve a problem. It is the number one uh, lean skill to master in our opinion. Now, if you want a sort of deeper explanation of the uh, LTF, there's a video on our website narrated by uh, John Shook. OK, so getting into the poster and looking at uh, purpose and why is problem solving important? So first of all, we need to think about um, accepting that problems are good. OK, we should see them as golden nuggets of opportunity rather than something to sweep underneath the carpet. As Taichi Ono said, having no problems is the biggest problem of all. We should therefore actively seek out problems and start digging them up uh, for people to tackle. However, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture, consider the flowchart on the right. So clearly as an organisation, we want to remain competitive, which means highlighting and solving uh, those problems. But in doing that, we have two big benefits and they are to develop the people and also develop the organisation. And really, that's why it's so important as you know, through problem solving and teaching and coaching it, we're obviously supporting the business and also um, the people development at the same time. So moving on to process and uh, some of the considerations around applying problem solving. And really we've kind of tried to boil this down to four key elements. Um, so the first one is to encourage a go and see approach. So as you can see from the picture number one, um, a bit like a crime scene investigator going to the actual place where the crime took place to see the evidence while it's still fresh to look for, uh, look for clues. Secondly, it's important to have a, a scientific method or approach um, to the problem solving. And in this case, we're you know, talking about the eight steps to follow or the process. Thirdly, encourage your PDCA thinking um, and close the loop. And most importantly, ask, you know, what did you learn for next time? The point of the clock in the middle is to invoke speed. So the better and quicker that we can go through the PDCA cycle, the faster we learn and the faster we improve. And finally, the last element is to never give up on reaching that um, ultimate goal. Each problem is solved is a step closer to that destination as leaders must recognise that achievement and encourage the people to take the next step. The next consideration in the problem solving is to explain, as I'm sure you understand, not one size fits all with respect to the types of problems and also the approach to take. In his book, uh, Art Smalley did a great job of describing four types of problems, uh, which you can see here, type one, two and three and four. 
So type one he described as troubleshooting and type two gap from standard. And he described these as kind of reactive or cause type problems. Type three is where you have a, a target condition and type four are those open ended types of problems. And these are <clears throat> created or proactive types of problems. So what we've tried to show here is that, you know, there are different methods you can apply to those different types of problems. So, for example, type one is described as troubleshooting those unexpected events. Uh, for example, you know, you get a flat tire. So clearly here you just need to react to the problem and fix it now and just change the tire. So in terms of the problem properties, many of these uh, types of problems happen, but they're relatively easy to fix. The analysis time is short and you don't uh, need to think about it too much. Just fix it now and these um, will probably happen to everyone in the organisation. I suppose the classic analogy here will be reacting to and on cord pulls on the moving assembly line. Moving up to rapid problem solving, you can see that this approach tends to work well for those type two and type three. So the gap from standard and the target condition type of problems. Typically a four step approach, this tends to be for those sort of data driven type issues uh, and used typically by those frontline leader of teams and also their members to to solve those types of problems. These problems by their nature are you know, quite frequent, but not too complicated or time consuming. But you know, we, uh, we do offer a structured approach to get to the root cause and uh, relative countermeasures. And also by using that method prepares them well for the thinking behind practical problem solving. So a practical problem is what we call the A3 eight step approach. Um, it's also suitable for type two and three problems, but also for some of the more challenging business issues. And in, um, in some cases, those difficult type four open ended problems. So these problems are tougher to solve and therefore take a bit more time and a deeper level of thinking than rapid. But often we get greater rewards and returns for that. The trick, however, is not just filling out and completing the A3 template, but it's more about the logic and the thinking way of solving the problem. With advanced methods and problems, these are you know, not so many of those around and they tend to be difficult and take a bit of time to solve with quite deep analysis and investigation. Uh, there's probably a smaller number of people in the organisation that can tackle these issues. And you know, often the result is actually a, a new product or a, you know, a new way of doing things, a real step change. But the point of the framework is really to get you to think about the types of problems people face and what's the best method for them to approach them, considering their level in the organisation. Um, why do we focus on practical? Well, as a leader, if you can master that, um, you'll not only improve the business, uh, but you'll also be able to teach and coach others in both practical and also rapid. And this will probably equip you for tackling probably over 90% of the problems in your organisation. OK, moving on to the last section of uh, people. So let's think about some roles and responsibilities in the organisation and the connection to problem solving. So starting with the simple hierarchy on the, the left, uh, what we want is for everyone in the organisation to be capable problem solvers, an army of them at all levels from team member right through to the top execs. Of course, we've just discussed that they're not all solving the same types of problems, but applying the right approach for those occurring at, at their level. If we consider the graphic on the uh, on the right and the blue, let's say that's you know improving processes is about tackling problems. So this model tries to show proportionally how much time we should spend doing those activities based upon where we are in the organisation. So at the lower level team member level, you know they should spend most of the time doing the value adding work or running the processes, but also have, have time made available to them to improve the process and also solve some of those problems. Obviously, moving to the top, the exec level, uh, we really want those people spending their time thinking about strategy and where the organisation is going uh, and improving what we currently do and also spending a small amount of time on, on running the business day to day. I suppose hopefully this kind of invokes the question, where do you see leaders in, in your business spending their time? Are they too busy, you know, firefighting, running the business day to day with no time for improvement? And, you know, why is that? Well, if the whole organisation isn't aligned and mobilised to solve problems at their level, then your leaders are always going to be too busy to improve. And that's why the concept of leaders as teachers is key to 
to embrace and allow the organization to grow through developing its people uh, into an army of problem solvers. And management routines uh, or leader standard work is a kind of key mechanism to facilitate the time to do this. So recognize uh, teaching, coaching, feedback to people on their problem solving capability development and their lean learning journey. OK, next slide, I think. So um, we've kind of covered the teach poster concept there, um, given an introduction to problem solving, covering purpose, process and people. All right, Dave. Yeah, go for it. OK, now David uh, Marriott's stolen all my thunder. Yeah? I'll uh, carry on. OK, so I'm going to start off with an interesting fact for this. So did you know that 60% of hiring managers can't find candidates with the right problem solving skills? So this is a good indication that we definitely need to get better at uh, problem solving. Uh, so in this section, we'll give you a high level overview of the thinking way behind each of the steps of the practical problem solving method, which is, uh, as you already said, is based on plan, do, check, act and hopefully demystify it a little bit for you. So just a bit of background, Toyota has situationally evolved and adapted their practical problem solving method over many years to match the maturity and the needs of their organisation. And their latest version is called Toyota Business Practice or TBP. But we shouldn't just blindly copy them with no thought to application or of it into different organisations who may have uh, less maturity and understanding, as Dave just mentioned. So our adapted version is called Practical Problem Solving, and it's more uh, useful situationally for the majority of people and organisations outside Toyota, uh, and it will help them apply the correct thinking way uh, for their level of maturity. This includes the need for understanding how to contain a problem uh, that was originally in Toyota's uh, method uh, and emphasised as part of the, their learning process, but that they've moved on from that now. But uh, we've gone back to their original approach. So practical problem solving is based on PDCA. As you can see from the steps, the numbers coloured in red. Most of the time is spent in planning, as Dave mentioned before, before doing anything. So really you can think this of uh, thinking before you act. OK, so using the PPS teach poster visuals, we'll do a brief overview of each of the steps now to show more of the thinking behind them. OK. So step one is called problem clarification. This is where you ask the question, what's the gap? This starts with understanding the problems that are coming onto your radar, as represented in the left hand little uh, picture there. So understanding and identifying the eight ways through observation can help you uncover the problems with the work in your organisation. A lot of the time we don't even understand what the problems have we got. So uh, by doing understanding the eight ways uh, in your organisation, you can I help identify some of those problems. So step one is uh, key as it clarifies the problem that you're trying to solve in simple numeric terms. So the problem should be stated as what we call a gap in relation to where you are today the current situation to where you want to be next, which is the ideal situation, and that's the gap. We should also think about how it's connected and contributes to the longer term goals and purpose of an organisation. We call that the ultimate goal. So remember, as Dave explained in the, the problem solving framework, there were two main types of gap. One is cause gap, where we need to get back to a standard when we've got an issue, we've drifted off the standard and we need to get back quickly to it. Or we've got a created gap where we need to improve from the current standard. So that could be with your hosting. Maybe you need to uh, up the quantity or provide better customer service and we need to improve from our current standard. Uh, so that's a created gap. But without a clear gap, a problem might just be a perception or opinion. It also creates alignment and stops us going in the wrong direction. So remember, the gap needs to be numeric and quantible uh, to, to the problem. OK, so step two then is containment. This is where we uh, ask if we can stop the problem now. So you need to think of step two is like a, a band aid or a plaster. It focuses on stopping the bleeding and protects the customer, which will then buy you time to solve the problem properly by following the rest of the steps. So stopping the problem flowing out immediately to an internal external customer will relieve pressure on the leadership 
not to jump to solutions, which unfortunately I see a lot of the time. And um, people under pressure, they jump to solutions and don't follow the problem solving. It also helps uh, collect the data and understand the problem better in the first place as well. A lot of problems don't have the data in the first place to, to, to understand it. But a warning, when uh, dealing with problems, a lot of organisations stop after step two containment. And unfortunately, this builds in waste and cost into your processes. And even worse, the problem could happen again as you didn't understand the causes and you end up in a firefighting loot in, in your organisation. So containment is only a stopgap uh, to solving the problem properly. OK, so step three then is also a very important step. As uh, Dave mentioned before, it breaks down the gap from step one into something you can tackle, but it takes time to do. So think of step three in comparison to uh, seeing a doctor when you're not well. So a little picture there, the, the person talking to the doctor. So hopefully a doctor would never just say, here is a prescription, this will fix your problem. The doctor would begin by asking you a series of questions to break your problem down, i.e. where's your pain or how long does it last? What does it feel like? And then may even investigate further with tests or x-rays if needed to understand what's really going on. So the use of data is key in order to break down the gap and understand what is happening through an inch wide mile deep approach but ensure that you use facts and data so you don't jump to solutions. There are seven problem solving tools to aid your data analysis and the use of Pareto charts will help you prioritize the biggest contributors to your gap. Visualization of data is key as it ensures you focus on the right issues with the biggest impact and contribution and also creates alignment around understanding the problem. So next we need to find the point of cause to understand where the problem happens. Ensure that you go see and study for yourself. This is done by walking back through the process steps to investigate and talk to people involved. Using the breakdown analysis, data and the point of cause, you can then define what we call the problem to pursue into a summary statement. This is the what, the where and the when. So everybody is clear about what problem you're going to tackle first. This is the problem you will try to solve, not the large vague gap from step one. It should be the contribution to closing that gap. OK, so on to the last bit of step three, which is the problem analysis and breakdown. So next we need to establish the direct causes of the problem to pursue. This should be uh, proven data or by experiment through go, see and study. So think of this, it's like a light switch. So to turn the cause and effect off, the effect stops. Every effect has a cause. This is what you must prove through data experiment. So use data to establish the direct causes or use an Ishikawa or fishbone diagram as a framework to structure the potential causes through brainstorming. The direct causes should be clearly summarised and proven with data, as these are what you want to, you need to prevent from reoccurring and we'll take to step five, which is to analyse their root causes, why they are happening. Okay. So step four then is target setting. This is where you determine how much you're going to close the gap by. A target and measure should be set against the problem to pursue. You will need to consider the impact of the gap by removing the direct causes from step three. So visualize the evolution of your target and the timing to show how much by when, where it's also key in managing expectations as well. So remember from uh, step three, we broke down the problem. You know, we're not going to solve a large uh, big gap straight away. We need to break that down manage the expectations in the organization of solving one thing at a time. So ensure your target uh, meets the uh, SMART criteria. So specific, measurable, appropriate, realistic and time bound. So to close the full gap stated in step one, you may need to repeat a process a few times of uh, going through setting a target and solving one part of the problem. So then step five moves on to the root cause. So step five focuses on finding the root cause of your problem using the five whys. Probably one of the most difficult parts of uh, the problem solving steps to do correctly. This is done by starting with a problem to pursue and then using the direct causes found in step three as the first level of your five whys analysis. By asking why you will drill down to the root causes. It might be more or less than five whys. But each why might give multiple answers, so you'll need to capture them all and use the data and facts at each stage to understand and prove the pathway to the root cause. 
You can then check your thinking logic by going back up the pathway and asking therefore. Make sure though that your root causes don't blame individuals. It's also should be something you can do, i.e. it should be in your, your organization's control or your control. And if addressed, most importantly, it should stop the problem happening again. OK, so on to step six then. So step six is uh, countermeasure and plan and focuses you on what you will do to close the gap. The starting point for developing countermeasures is the root cause from the analysis made in the first five steps. So now you can develop specific actions to address the specific root causes rather than the large vague gap from step one. This is why people sort of fail to solve problems because they jump to solutions and don't go through the breakdown steps and don't get to the root cause. So in this step, you should have more than one countermeasure idea to think of and have at least three alternative ideas. The countermeasure idea should be evaluated based upon some kind of relevant criteria, i.e. maybe cost or lead time or risk. The countermeasures should then be prioritised based on the evaluation and by their contribution on how much they will close the gap by. A countermeasure should make a change uh, by doing something different. It should be planned and implemented quickly through PDCA to ensure they see through, uh, they are seen through to a conclusion, their impact is evaluated. I think someone mentioned a question about measurements before. So it's very important to show that and we'll come to that next. But teamwork and the right behaviours is key to seeing countermeasures through correctly. So there's a lot of focus on teamwork and working together on countermeasures. So step seven then is all about checking the results. So checking the results of the countermeasures by asking how much did we close the gap by? So ongoing measurement enables us to understand the impact of your countermeasures that addresses the root cause of the problem to pursue. You should use the measures identified in step four target setting and summarise the results data shown uh, in conclusions and the key learnings from it. For step seven, we should ask, did we meet the target? By how much did we close the gap? And what else do we need to do? It's also very important to check if you can remove the containment now at this stage that we put in place from step two, so we don't build waste into our work. <clears throat> well, that's how we evaluate the effectiveness of our countermeasures. So the last step is standardise and share. Um, this focuses on uh, standardising the changes made and sharing the learning from the activity. This involves creating or updating work standards to use as a new baseline for the work and to do further improvements. Also, periodic process checks should also be used to help maintain and review problems with the new way of working. You need to create a plan to share uh, using the five W's and two H's to think of where else we can use this learning to benefit the organisation both internally and externally. A distinct advantage for Toyota is that they have a very good eight step process. Team members take personal responsibility to share out the learning to the organisation and they also use it to develop people's thinking way about improvement. OK, look, I'm sorry you had the host pipe there. This was a very uh, brief overview. If you want uh, further detail on the eight steps, there's also we've got a 30 minute introductory uh, PPS video available on our website uh, for you to review. Uh, but our skill level two course gives you as much uh, more detailed understanding of the thinking way behind each step and you'll work your way through uh, that using a case study. OK, so um... If you can't explain it simply enough, um, then you don't understand it well enough. So a famous quote from, from Albert Einstein, and really that is the thinking behind A3s, being able to simply explain your thinking on one piece of paper. Um, as you can appreciate though, that's a real skill and takes time to do. And in our level two understanding course, we show you how to complete a PPS A3 using a case study. So the case study provides a fictional sequence of events for a logistics leader, um, who's challenged with the problem of reducing his vehicle operating costs. So each step is broken down as per the process that Peter has just explained. Uh, part of it is in the form of dialogue with his coach, supplemented by data and information gained as he proceeds with his investigation. And the, the objective is to then translate that content into each section of the, the A3. You get a chance to do this yourself uh, and then compare with how a solution may look, as you can see on the on the screen. An emphasis is on visualisation and being able to summarise the key points to build the case and solve the problem. 
OK, so the, the case study is all well and good and gives you some understanding of applying the eight steps to an actual problem and creating a, a PPSA3. However, the challenge comes when people start to tackle their own problems. And I suppose this is when the rubber hits the road, shall we say, and often can be quite uh, a daunting prospect. Uh, all logic goes out the window and it can be easier to start jumping to conclusions as we just discussed rather than following the eight steps. So to try and combat this, therefore, we've also created a guide to describe what a good PPS A3 looks like. So again, each step is broken down, covering all of the key points in the teach poster um, in terms of what you should ex expect to see on the A3. So for step three, for example, it takes you through breaking the problem down using the seven problem solving tools, making sure you've adequately summarized the problem uh, to pursue, describing the what, the where, the when into a simple statement. Uh, remind us about finding direct causes which switch on and off the problem like the light switch, uh, as, as also because you know because they become the first why in your five why analysis and from our experience with feedback you know people have found this quite a useful aid memoir to make sure that people follow the steps but that's only part of the story uh, the last piece of the a3 jigsaw puzzle is being able to evaluate whether someone has met the criteria of following the eight step process and completing the a3 to a good level and also importantly solving the problem so to address this, we've developed um, an A3 evaluation method. So it covers all of the eight steps and also the ninth criteria of the A3 overall. So each step is taken uh, again and broken down into three criteria. So we've got the expected content, which you can see on the left from the poster. Uh, evaluation level, which is a score out of, uh, out of five. And more importantly, coaching questions. So they offer the leader kind of open style questions to encourage the right thinking for each step and steer the team member in the right direction uh, to achieve the desired evaluation level. So how does that evaluation process uh, work? So for on-site face-to-face -face situations, it's a relatively low-tech, high involvement activity. So as you can see, the PPS is printed sort of A0, big size, and presented back to the team members for review and discussion. So the team members are encouraged to ask coaching questions using the evaluation criteria as a guide. And the purpose is to get them to develop their coaching skills whilst developing the PPS owners thinking on the problem. Um, at the end, we use a sticky note to record the rating or the score, but more importantly, uh, the recognition points uh, for each step and also the improvement point, points as well to get them to the next level. Uh, the name is added to the so the PPS owner can go back and clarify any points later on when they're reviewing their, their A3. For online situations, so it's a similar process, but we've just kind of automated that on a on a spreadsheet to capture the uh, the scores and also the comments. So the PPS is pre presented step by step um, on Teams uh, by the owner and the team members then review and discuss it kind of face to face. So rather than using sticky notes, the ratings and comments are captured and rolled up into a, a progress summary which as you can see you can uh, shows their evolution over over time and a number of evaluations that we conduct so here's a kind of typical outcome of, of following this process that we've done with other organizations um, so this is an example of a, a pps looking at reducing the cost of poor quality uh, by a guy called michael who was a tool room manager so the business was a 24 7 365 days a year plastic injection molding company and they were supplying electrical connectors to the automotive industry. So the site had approximately 110 uh, injection molding machines and obviously hundreds of tools um, as well to accommodate the, the part variants that they got. So he initially identified a gap of approximately 215k from the prior year. And by following the process and focusing on the top 10 tools, he identified core breakages uh, as a problem to pursue and identify three direct causes amongst those uh, those tools. So the cores are part of the tools which create the cavities in the uh, in the connectors. Um, he set his target to close the gap by approximately one third or 72,000. Uh, so again, as Peter mentioned, breaking it down, not addressing the whole gap. Um, some of his root causes were there was no formal feedback process from manufacturing to the tool designers for troublesome core designs that were, which were breaking often. Um, there was no clear fitting standard for the cores in the tool room. Uh, tool maintenance frequency was based on uh, time, not the actual workload of the tool. 
um, and there's no proactive tracking process for, for tool spares procurement and, and delivery. So by following the, the process, so his actual result was a reduction of just uh, under 74k, so um, slightly ahead of target. Um, however, that was just a couple of the worst tools that he, he focused on when he broke the problem down. So if you start to think about the Yoka 10 or the look across potential to the other tools, um, when he can apply those countermeasures, and then uh, we start to see sort of uh, big, big improvements. But this is just one example from our experience. Um, savings are typically of the, in the order of around about 25,000k for, for uh, PPSs. So as I mentioned, it's, it's at that sort of business level. Um, however, the key point is not really the money in this case. It's the fact that Michael went on to train four of his uh, tool technicians in uh, PPS for them to deliver similar kind of projects. Um, Michael was part of an initial team of six leaders that we developed to teach and coach others. So I'll let you do the maths, but you can see soon how um, the numbers uh, quickly add up. So I expect you're all asking, how can you get your people to do this? So I'll let uh, Peter explain our thinking uh, and process for that. Peter, over to you. You're on mute. The fiber for me as well now. <laughs> OK, so I suspect uh, most of you thinking that this is all good, but uh, the real issue for me is how do I learn this well as an individual or cascade it successfully into uh, your organization? So where do you start? Well, external training can be confusing, expenses are very often done as a quick one off training activity to achieve a certificate or belt instead of a supported and progressive skill development journey. So real learning and skills are achieved through on the job practice with support, just like learning to drive. To build a true problem solving culture in an organisation, it can only be done when the line leadership become the teachers and coaches. So this uh, thinking way, in, so then the thinking way and behaviours become embedded at every level in the organisation. Our research uh, with partners and companies applying A3 PPS has uh, helped us develop a better, faster, cheaper learning journey for A3 problem solving that uh, either individuals or organisations can follow and learn it well, and also, more importantly, cascade it throughout their organisation. So what does the, our recommended uh, lean learning journey look like for A3 practical problem solving? Well, first, it's to gain some initial basic knowledge around uh, the purpose, process and people of the topic to get familiar with it, most of which you've covered today. So we can tick the box on that one. But we offer a free online skill uh, level one course for you or your organisation to use. And you can uh, also buy maybe some of our related books on the, the basic knowledge of the topic from our eShop as well. The next step on your lean learning journey after the basic knowledge is to be taught a deeper understanding of the thinking way behind the eight steps and do some initial safe practice of developing uh, an A3 on a known case study, as Dave mentioned before. This way you can reflect on the case study answers and the learn from your mistakes uh, within the case study. This is actually how Toyota developed their people at the beginning when they came across from Japan to the US uh, and they went through several case studies with them first. You uh, once you've gone through uh, level two, you can then go on to skill level three. And this is aimed at making you capable through step by step implementation on a real business problem. However, you should be coached by an experienced skill level four leader, someone who's able to teach and coach. And you should also implement directly on a, a real business need. So we shouldn't be training independently. We should be developing skill on the job on real business problems. <laughs> An experienced PPS A3 coach is necessary so you can receive the right feedback and the correct evaluation process, as Dave mentioned before, uh, to develop your skill. Uh, much as also described in John Shook's book, Managing to Learn, that uh, delves a lot into that coaching process. If you have a role as a leader, though, in an organisation, then we recommend that you go on to complete skill level four so you can do PPS A3 well. Uh, and you will have done multiple of those, but also be able to teach and coach others in it, which is uh, where we really want to make it sustainable in the organisation. Here we recommend you gain more experience through completing multiple uh, problem solving activities yourself and then also <laughs> develop some basic coaching skills necessary uh, before you start to teach and coach others. You should then aim to successfully develop and evaluate at least two other people in practical problem solving to skill level three. Uh, so they can become capable as well. 
So depending on your circumstances, or if you don't have access to internally to a skill level four coach, we can offer you online or face-to-face -face level coaching skills for levels one to four. Just contact us directly if you're interested in any of that support. Okay, so really what does this uh, learning process look like in practice? Uh, and especially now in, in today's age when we do this remotely with organizations. So I'll give you a flavor of, of how this happens. So our learning process is based on PDCA. It's running groups of one to five leaders maximum to ensure that there's enough time available to support them properly. After an initial kickoff session, the leaders start to progress uh, through the skill levels one and two by completing multiple short bursts learning sessions using our interactive online learning platform. The learning then is initially practiced through a case study, as we mentioned before, and homework is set as part of the uh, learning sessions. After the homework is completed, uh, a live group debrief session is held by the coach on each of the learners' answers. This is done to reflect and feedback and confirm that they have achieved the right level base knowledge and understanding for skill level one and two. Then we move on to gain capability at level three. The group members start working on a real business problem where they complete one step at a time of their A3 offline and then present it back to the group members and the LEA coach through uh, an hourly, on, uh, hourly online coaching sessions. In these sessions, the leaders receive direct feedback on the improvement points through being asked a series of coaching questions and also agreeing what their next steps are going to be. At certain stages of each of the leaders, A3 A3 is formally evaluated, as Dave went through before, against the standard criteria. And this is to check the right way of thinking and the visual story uh, on the A3 has been shown correctly. We do this through one hour sessions held over 12 weeks until all eight steps on the A3 have been completed. And at the end, there is also a final online report out to each of the leaders uh, and their senior management as well. Once the leaders have achieved level three skill, they can then act on it by starting to teach and coach others by progressing through to skill level four learning process. This starts off with the leaders have some initial short burst learning and practice sessions on how to teach and coach each other. Then they have to select and support two other leaders through the same skill level three development process I mentioned before. And this is done over 14 weeks. An LEA coach has several review points with both the internal leaders and uh, the learners to reflect and adjust their approach and ensure that the learning process is uh, being carried out robustly. The aim is uh, by following this learning process, organizations can become self-reliant in their leaders developing others. Okay, so what uh, are the some of the results from that? So remember to achieve level three and become capable, you should have access to an experienced level four coach to support you through working on a real business problem. Using the learning process, individuals can get good results and great personal learnings, even on their first problem solving A3. So a good example here is this is one of our partner organizations, the Canal and River Trust Charity. We taught four finance leaders A3 practical problem solving up to level three skill capable using the method described uh, previously. And they'd never done any problem solving before like this. So part of the level three course is to do a final report out to their senior management. And these comments are taken from uh, Hannah's final report out to the uh, CEO describing her personal key learning points and benefits for, to the organisation from her very first problem solving using the uh, practical problem solving approach. So Hannah's key learning points show how the organisation's default mindset, which was very much of silo thinking and blaming each area and department, and this really they started to change and help break down some of the organisational barriers only if they follow the eight steps though correctly. The mindset change through the involvement of team members is key. So it's not just the leaders trying to solve the problems anymore. Now these leaders are teaching rapid problem solving to their uh, members and supporting other leaders on being developed in A3 uh, practical problem solving. So they are well on the journey now to becoming self-reliant. And I think I'm gonna hand over to Dave now for the last uh, couple of slides. OK, thanks, Pete. Um, well, thanks, Dave. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something Peter highlighted. We've known for a long time that the real benefits of lean occur when organisations and individuals um, are self-reliant. However, few organisations have become self-reliant without a process to do that and to keep doing it. In other words, continually learning. 
So if you're running a company, a site or a department or a team, please ask yourself how you're developing that capability. Do you have a process for it? And if you are an internal or an external lean practitioner, please ask whether you operate a process for doing this. Organisations need to develop people and get the work done, stroke improve their performance at the same time. Any capability development process needs improvements on at least two dimensions. Firstly, deepening capability through practice of a level, and secondly, developing a journey through the levels. You need everyone able to do, but not necessarily everyone able to teach. However, the more teachers you have, the more you'll be able to spread the doing. And the argument for leaders as teachers is extremely strong. Uh, and it's not the way that many have gone about implementing lean, really. Uh, and and, and that, that's, that's a, it's a concern. So um, we've provided an overview of a teach method, the teach poster method. We've uh, exploring problem solving in terms of purpose, process and people. We then gave you an overview of the eight step method, as well as a PPSA three and the evaluation method. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.